Okay. Okay, welcome everyone to this new IFIMAC ICMM online seminar. Uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce our friend and colleague, Son Moleski. And uh, I made the effort to look through his webpage and uh, I'm, I think I'm prepared a, a bio that is fair. If you want to correct anything that I say, please go ahead, Son. Okay. So Son is, a, I don't know, associate or assistant, I don't know yet, but professor in the Department of Engineering Physics and the Institute for Data Valor, Valor, Valorization, IVADO, no? at Polytechnic uh, Montreal. He obtained his PhD from the University of Alberta in 2017, and he received the Governor's General Gold Medal and the George Walker Prize in recognition for the quality of his job on the, under the, the guidance of another friend, Professor Zubin Jacob. Then, between 2017 and 2021, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow uh, under the supervision of uh, Alejandro Rodriguez in Princeton. And uh, some uh, research interests lie at the intersection of photonics, optimization, and computational modeling, broadly encompassing questions pertaining to inverse design that we will hear about today, yeah. universal characteristics of wave phenomena and their limits, and the development of numerical methods. And at the end of his bio, uh, he added a sentence. Uh, he wants to say that uh, he's actively looking for postdocs and postdoctoral researchers uh, with broadly overlapping interests. So an announcement for free for you, San. Yeah, so, San, the time is if, you have, uh, if you have funding already, that's great. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> so you are going to talk us about a dual perspective of inverse design. So, Son, please go ahead. Okay, uh, so thank you for the very kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to be talking, uh, as Antonio said, about a dual perspective for inverse design. So to kind of set the stage, all of this is going to be within the viewpoint of optimization and this field of inverse design. So I want to talk about that um, to start. What we're really thinking of is the global picture of engineering is optimization. So without too much of a stretch, or kind of, I guess, my personal belief is that really the vast majority of engineering can be understood as optimization. In the end, when you're trying to design something, when you're trying to engineer something to do something, really you have some objective in mind and your goal is to achieve that objective as best possible given some set of constraints. So the kind of techniques that I'm going to talk about today apply to this general idea of optimization um, almost in its entirety, specifically for, I guess, not in its entirety, for continuous optimization. So when you're thinking about fields, and they can be applied in really many, many different contexts. So I'm going to be talking about kind of abstract properties and kind of general features but it really is applicable to all sorts of real applications that you might care about. So as you uh, listen throughout the presentation, hopefully it's interesting enough and I can tell you something that you can use in your own work. It might be useful to have in mind one of your favorite applications. So uh, if you have a background in photonics, you can be thinking about um, light trapping in a solar cell or sensing, maybe this idea of uh, a cloak or something where you're trying to limit the scattering of uh, free fields off an object. Any one of the kind of different photonic general uh, things that people work on, any one of the big applications or big application areas of photonics can be treated with this optimization problem. And I think this is true of many other areas as well. You can also think about this optimization framework for many different kinds of areas, many different kinds of applications. And with that, hopefully get something interesting that can be used in your own work. Okay, so um, this idea of inverse design more specifically is that within this optimization problem, we wanna to try to get computers to do the job for us. So uh, specifically in optics, I think we have a pretty good um, motivation for trying to do this. And really it's just that the human brain can't picture these fields and how they're gonna transform under scattering. That's um, not something we're equipped to do. We can't really understand how electromagnetic fields or we can't visualize how electromagnetic fields are going to 
interact with material objects and boundaries, except in very, very high symmetry configurations. And even then with some kind of approximations and intuitive ideas about how this works. A computer, of course, can just do these calculations so it can see the field. It can see all the different um, things that happen to the field. And when you make a little change to your scattering object or you change the geometry that it's interacting with, that change the material that your um, electromagnetic wave is interacting with, it can immediately calculate that and understand how things are changing. And that gives it a really big advantage. So kind of the first approach of this has been mostly gradient based things. And we're looking at a huge number of degrees of freedom and then kind of engineering the geometry to achieve some kind of objective. And this has been going on since at least um, the mid to late 90s and has progressed a lot. So the real purpose of this slide is to just give you a perspective of how much things have improved going from kind of like single waveguides to now we're almost doing inverse design on whole um, many wavelength scale objects and the field has progressed even from where I made this slide it's progressed a lot with new machine learning um, based approaches it's getting better all the time and it's improving rapidly so to kind of give some of the big picture takeaways um, that I think are important for not just the engineering part but for what we get out of this is from kind of physics is uh, I'm going to give, go through a couple of examples. Uh, they're both fairly old, but I think they, they get the major points across. So the first one is taken from some work that Alejandro did with uh, Zin Lin in 2016. And this was on trying to improve second harmonic generation efficiency in a nanophotonic device. So broadly, the efficiency of second harmonic generation is approximated as this product of three things. Uh, the quality factor at the first frequency squared, the quality factor at the second frequency squared, and the absolute value squared of this beta uh, coefficient. And this beta coefficient is kind of the extension of your phase matching rules that you might be familiar with if you've worked in nonlinear optics on kind of larger systems. So this beta coefficient is like a field overlap coefficient saying how energy is going to flow from the first frequency to the second frequency. And these quality factors uh, for people not working in photonics, these are like the how much energy is stored in your cavity. So basically a larger quality factor means you have a better mode, uh, light is trapped, you don't have radiation going out, things are persisting within your cavity for a very long time. So it's kind of the quality factor of your effective oscillator describing one mode. So for a very long time, people in nanophotonics looked at this expression and they said, well, these field overlap coefficients, I don't really know what to do with those. Um, pretty difficult to understand how this thing is going to evolve with geometry. But quality factors, I know how to I know how to get good quality factors. To get a good quality factor, I need a high uh, quality resonance. What I need to do is trap light. So if I make a ring resonator or kind of a fabric perot cavity, I put mirrors just like in a laser. Well, I can get very good quality factors. And if I get very good quality factors, I would think uh, I'm going to get very good second harmonic generation efficiency. And so for a very long time, people were trying kind of like micro ring resonators, things like this, uh, where the quality factor at the frequent at both frequencies can be very, very large, like 10 to the five is not unreasonable, 10 to the four, sort of something like that. When you put this on a computer, it does something totally different. It actually doesn't do high quality factors. Uh, so we're not sure these are the best designs, and I'll get into that point more later. But the vast majority of the best performing cases have actually very low quality factors. So like 10 to the 3, a couple orders of magnitude often lower than what you could get in one of these high symmetry geometries. And how the computer ends up nonetheless beating these high quality factor geometries, or like these, these good mode uh, quality geometries, is that the overlap factor is way, way, way bigger. So one of the things that happens in high symmetry is that your modes are actually linked to some kind of symmetry transformation of your, your geometry. So you kind of may be familiar with this uh, periodic systems, it's like a blocks theorem, but for a high symmetry system, there's also um, analogs that happen. And so when you have two different frequencies, especially if one frequency is doubled from the other, then your 
different symmetries that kind of underlie very, very high quality factor modes, they end up um, giving you a situation where your field at the two frequencies is almost completely orthogonal. So if you, if you try one of these high symmetry geometries and, and you make the quality factors really good, there's a natural push towards you ending up in a situation where your fields actually have almost no overlap. So the computer takes this other route and does very good overlap and very poor cavities. And actually this is great for, um, you, for your bandwidth questions, things like this, for response speed. There's a lot of reasons to prefer a low quality factor that have nothing to do with even putting into the simulation, but this is what the computer finds. And it's kind of, again, getting back to this idea of the advantage the computer has is it can think about fields um, and it can think about the scattering of fields in a very complex way. Um, the second example is from some work we did um, with Kai Mei Fu's group at the University of Washington. And this was about trying to, um, it was for some quantum memory application, but the crux of the problem from our perspective was trying to improve the interaction between an embedded dipole emitter and free space radiation. So I think this is pretty indicative of the kind of problems we're usually faced with. So for some reasons, uh, usually to do with electronic structure or something else, experimentalists generally have some kind of material platform in mind. And then we are able to do inverse design subject to some fabrication constraints in some smaller volume um, related to the design. And we're trying to achieve some objective from this. So here, the diamond substrate, um, people were interested in diamond for its properties in, in the spin states and these nitrogen vacancy centers. And based on that, we're kind of forced to, there's only a small selection of materials. We don't want to engineer. We don't want to do any kind of structuring too close to the NV centers because we'll kind of ruin the electronic properties of the, the center. So we can only do engineering or we can only kind of change the interaction that light is going to have with the material at a distance for nanophotonics, it's fairly far away. And we only have a kind of different selection of materials that we can use. We have to worry about minimum feature size, these sort of things. But we can design, design these things. And the goal here was to enhance the flux. So enhance the interaction of free space light with this implanted NV center. And this would let you, in principle, kind of like address the memory as well as possible. So this is, you have to have some way of controlling the, these nitrogen vacancy centers you would like to do it optically, this is looking at how well you can do. And the important takeaway is buried in this slightly complicated graph. So there's two sets of lines and two sets of markers. And these have to do with what we're looking at. So one is looking at flux enhancement. The other one is looking at LDOS enhancement. So the LDOS is the local density of states. And this is sort of a, a catch-all in photonics for thinking about the strength of interaction. So the local density of states kind of tells you how many addressable modes you have at one position in space. And this is very much related to the strength of the electric field that's going to happen at that position, and in turn, how strong of, of electromagnetic interactions you can have with um, material. So we did two different kinds of objectives, one where we told the computer to maximize the flux. And the other one where we told the computer to maximize this LDOS at the position of the emitter. For people working in nanophotonics, LDOS is, is usually considered as kind of like the easiest thing to think about. It's the thing we would say, okay, if I want strong light matter interactions and the rest of the problem is too complicated to think about, what I'm gonna go for is I'm gonna go for strong LDOS. Um, high LDOS means good interactions. This is, this is kind of the key to, to most applications. And so if you're, um, you're kind of not exactly sure what you should do, this is a great catch-all. Much easier to think about than the flux objective. What we found though, is that although we kind of think that these things are very similar, or they should be very similar in this case where we have you know, small separation distances. It's a very nice system. We're thinking we're in, we're in this very good nanophotonic regime where we can use near field enhancement and all these kind of um, advantages that, that would seem to favor LDOS or make LDOS a very good analog of flux enhancement. 
the computer disagrees. So when you give it this flux, flux objective, it actually does not enhance the LDOS very much. It, it chooses to enhance the LDOS very little. And you can see this in the fact that the blue curve with the red squares is actually very small. Uh, if you tell the computer to enhance the LDOS instead, the performance in terms of flux is way worse. So this is a second kind of indication of why computers offer superior performance in a lot of different areas related to complex engineering design is that as, the, as a designer, we have to kind of make approximations when we, we're, we can't think about all the details. There's just too many details to really take them all into account. So we have to chunk things together into simpler concepts that we can really use to, to drive our design procedure. And it's not clear how much we're giving up when we do that. In most of these cases, you know, we only have a handful of, of design examples that have kind of been used for many, many years. And then now this is exploding with computation, but okay, stick, sticking with our kind of intuitive shapes, we don't really have so many examples. And so we kind of have to use these, these approaches and it's not clear what we give up. And when we do the optimizations, we find that we actually give up a lot. So there's a lot lurking there uh, in certain kinds of applications where we could do much better if we were actually just thinking about the whole detail of the problem instead of our approximations of the problem. So this gets me to the reoccurring issues that are really going to be at the, the heart of what I want to present. In this optimization problem, uh, I'm going to just be talking about linear photonics, so linear material scattering. And so you might think this is a pretty easy problem. But it turns out that as soon as you allow for this variety of geometry, so you can say, you say that I can allow this material, it's a linear medium, but I can allow it to take on any geometry I like, then the relationship between the structure, the geometry of this thing, and the scattered fields that you get is non-convex and we think really difficult to understand. So basically this is kind of like, what does our optimization landscape look like? We think it has many, many little hills uh, and there's no easy way to get a good view of what this overall landscape is. All of our algorithms are either kind of like surrogate models. So this would be something like a machine learning approach or a local approximation of this landscape. And so when you run your optimization, it's very hard to say prior to, <laughs> prior to doing it or prior to running kind of like an exhaustive number of searches, what kind of performance should be expected for a given application. So there's this non-convex relationship, which means from an optimization perspective, there's no clear way to, to match your gradients with global, uh, there's no clear way to find global minimum or maximum. This is not something you can easily do by finding kind of like uh, zeros of your gradient. And because of this, we don't know a priori how well the algorithms are going to do. And we don't know when the algorithms should stop. So this adds a really big kind of trial and error piece to this whole business of inverse design, where we're looking at how big should the design domain be? Um, what is being caused by the physics? What is being caused by the things that I chose? What is being caused by the material? All of this is kind of unclear because there might be, there always could be sort of, unless you have some a priori worked out reason why such a thing cannot exist. A design that achieves everything you want within the confines of the constraints that you set up to uh, initially see your problem. And there's always kind of this give and pull between should I keep going? Should I keep trying the same algorithm allowing me to search? Or maybe I need to try a different algorithm. Maybe I need to make my box a little bit bigger. Maybe I need to um, try a different material. None of this is really known in general for these kind of problems. And, and this is really what I want to talk about and hopefully get at with the idea of introducing duality into these inverse design problems. <clears throat> so to have a picture in mind, what I'm really kind of talking about uh, specifically in the problems I'm looking at is this ability to completely change the shape of some material within a confined volume of space. And so this is pretty, um, a pretty good description of most of the inverse design problems that, that we have to do for, that we would like to do for experimentalists. And uh, 
just to give a bit more context, we can think of uh, a dipole interacting with this object and say, maybe we're trying to maximize the radiation into free space. And we want to consider kind of the limit case of these inverse design optimizations where I have complete control over the shape of the object inside this confined region of space. So here, this is the red ball. And I'm saying that within this red ball, I have some kind of material, but I can structure that material however I like. So it can have as many holes. Um, it can be any geometry of this material. Anywhere, any position in space can either be material or not. And so um, this is actually an easier formulation to, to have the computer deal with than the fabrication constrained optimization. And it's great for looking at these kind of bounds and things. So this is the jumping off point. What's shown on the right here is two examples that the computer finds for this kind of problem. So this is uh, the one on the left is a full 3D look at a topology optimized geometry for enhancing the radiation generated by a dipole. So we kind of have a little dipole on top and then the computer decides should each point within this domain be material or not. And it comes up with this kind of intuitive sort of looking thing, kind of crazy. And then the picture on the far right is a cross cut of the same shape. So it's showing you that there's kind of um, like these little cavities within the within this structure. There's sort of a regularity at the outside of the structure, which sort of get, brings to mind ideas of like a bullseye. So some of the intuitive features are still there, but uh, it's kind of combined in a very complicated way. And we would like to know, is this actually a good structure or not? So sure, it might be better than what we can come up with, but is this just another structure and the computer has found one thing, but tomorrow we'll find something better? Or is this actually getting close to some real physics where we should try to understand what's going on here because fundamentally this structure has something to do with maximizing this, it's somehow optimal. So it's telling us about optimal characteristics of electromagnetics related to this problem. And uh, another way to look at this is we're really trying to understand this gap. So we, know that the formulation of this electromagnetic design problem, even though it seems kind of easy, is actually NP hard. So it's in this really difficult optimization complexity class, um, at least on its surface. So I mean, this doesn't, this doesn't say in practice how hard these problems are to solve, but at least in their full generality, they're an NP hard problem class. And we have our intuitive designs, which are the things we can kind of come up with it within our heads and say, okay, this kind of makes sense this high symmetry geometry should accomplish this goal, or maybe an interaction with um, some kind of material resonance, a plasmon. And then from there, we know that we should be able to improve using optimization. So we can always kind of take whatever we come up with, put it on a computer, have it do some optimization or have the computer do optimization entirely. And this should give us better performance towards, towards our objective. But what's usually unclear is how far this gets towards optimality. So there could be a gap, maybe the things that computers come up with, they're a factor of 10 to the three better than what we had before, but maybe they're actually still not good designs. We're, we're not sure about that. It could be that there's something that's 10 to the six better. Um, or alternatively, it could be that although the computer isn't finding anything better, this is actually a feature of the problem. There's, you know, the constraints of Maxwell's equations don't allow arbitrarily good performance. So it could be that the reason why we're not finding better performance is because physically that's not possible. And we're really trying to shrink this gap between what we know in terms of performance and what we know in terms of optimality uh, in the hope of learning some additional things about physics. So there's kind of two big approximations that we're gonna use. The first uh, is kind of a mean field relaxation idea. And this is that if we go to a volume um, integral formulation of Maxwell's equations, then we don't have to use consistent cell sizes. We kind of don't have to think in terms of the, the differential equation way. We can say these equations are true on average, but they're not necessarily true microscopically. So in this picture I have uh, put on the screen, there's a bunch of these different boxes. And in one of the boxes, there's these colored fields, red and blue. And what we're getting at with this mean field relaxation idea is kind of like relaxing the constraints. So it's saying in this big box, we have these alterations of the field. This, this means like um, 
positive and negative violations of the true physics. So kind of like if I, if I were to look at the physics on a microscopic level, if I were to look at every point, I would see that my equations are violated, that you know, Maxwell's equations don't hold with this field. But if I integrate over a volume, I see that actually now it holds, that the violation of the, the constraint cancels. So this kind of means that on average, the field respects the physics, but from a microscopic view, it doesn't. And what we can do with this is it kind of gives us an extra knob for playing with how much physics we want to put into the problem. And this lets us make the optimization problems easier or harder um, by, by introducing more of these constraints. So kind of like at the first level, we could just say, I want Maxwell's equations to be true on average over the volume of this whole big box. And as I push down, as I try to get closer and closer to reality, I can say I want Maxwell's equations to be true over these integration volumes of smaller and smaller boxes. Um, in most problems, there's a wavelength limit. So, you know, the Green's function associated with our, with our problem, it has a natural wavelength. And so as long as our sources don't have arbitrarily fast oscillations, then there is a natural characteristic length associated with each one of these problems, where if we impose the constraints over a volumes that are much smaller than this characteristic length, then that becomes equivalent to true physics. So this is sort of the same idea of why can we do computational modeling in the first place? It's that ultimately we don't have to get things right infinitely precisely. After a certain size, um, that's enough. So we can, we can do kind of this, uh, this chunking and as long as these boxes are very, very small, it's equivalent to looking, or it's a very good approximation of the true continuous fields that, uh, that we believe in through Maxwell equations. Okay, um, this slide is not so crucial, but helpful for what's going on in the rest. The formalism that I use for introducing the constraints is done through scattering theory. And uh, this has, I think, some advantages, but not so critical. However, for the purpose of understanding the rest of my slides, I thought I would uh, just introduce it quickly. So the idea here is kind of uh, self-consistency. So you start with some kind of initial current. This initial current generates an electromagnetic field. This electromagnetic field interacts with some kind of polarizable object. And to first order, we can just say, you know, at each position of the object where there or wherever there is material, I get another dipole, I get a new dipole. And this new dipole acts exactly like my first one. So it also creates this radiation pattern that goes out. And from there, I get second order interactions, right? So the field generated by this generated dipole, wherever there's material and that field overlaps with material, it generates the, another dipole. And this process kind of goes on and goes on and goes on, getting weaker and weaker. Uh, this is not always true, but this is the, the nice case of weak scattering that's being explained. And eventually you get to a point of self-consistency. And so what this means, um, this self-consistent point, is that in the end, I have a total current distribution, or I have something I can describe as a total current distribution, that when I just act with the free space Green's function, that gives me the correct total electro electromagnetic field for the whole problem. So it's kind of like I turn this problem um, about the initial current interacting with the geometry into something just about some current um, emitting in free space. So some, some current source in free space. And through Maxwell's equations, this uh, relationship must be linear. And so there, there's in fact a linear operator that maps between initial currents for a given material uh, geometry. So kind of like this T operator encompasses both the material properties of the scattering object and the geometry of the scattering object. Both these things are important. And for any initial current, this T operator will map that initial current into a total current, which could then be used with the free space Green's function to completely describe the, the physics of my problem. So kind of like all the scattering physics becomes buried in this T operator. And the equation for the T operator is equivalent to Maxwell's equation. So kind of postulating that this T operator is the inverse of um, the material volume, the material properties, which I'm writing as V here, V minus one. 
minus the background greens function is equal to the identity within the volume of the scattering object. So that's what these little subscripts on the on the big I's mean, and the little B subscript means background. This equation that the T operator is the inverse of this free space greens function minus the inverse of the scattering potential is actually equivalent to Maxwell's equation. Equation. So it's just another way of reframing this. And why is this nice? Well, for optimization, it's nice because the T operator then captures all the characteristics about the geometry. And in particular, it means that if the geometry changes, I don't have to rewrite my constraint equations if I'm kind of a little bit clever. So in this first equation, I have uh, little subscripts S that denote within the scattering object and there's zero elsewhere. But if I put in a second copy of the T operator, then I don't have to talk about projection into the scattering um, object twice. So kind of if I come in with a T dagger from the left, then this IS projection into the scattering object is redundant because the T operator is already only creating a current wherever we have material. So I don't have to project uh, twice sort of thing. Then we can say from an optimization perspective, I can write constraints as just some arbitrary vector. So I know that this is a linear relationship. When I come in with my initial source field S, I know that the T operator is going to create some kind of image vector T. And so for any geometry made of this material, it's true that the um, linear functional associated with this vector or any projection operator that is uh, local in space, so not mixing spatial points, and our, our source, these equations must be true. So this, this complete set of equations with the little arrow, T dagger P S, T dagger P V minus one minus G B T, these have to always be true for any object. So it's kind of like, now I can make this, this box around my problem. And regardless of what the actual geometry of the thing is, I know that if this T vector is actually a physical current generated through this T operator, then it will satisfy these equations. The um, next trick we do is this idea of duality. So our primal problem for many different um, it's actually a, a totally generalized framework of this quadratically constrained quadratic program. But many uh, objectives that have to do with power transfer, so uh, to first order, we'll just stick with the ones that are naturally written in this form. Any objective that has to do with power transfer when you're talking about fields naturally has a quadratic form. So energy or power transfer is always related to a bilinear of the fields. And so when we were we're looking to optimize some kind of quantity associated with power transfer, which really covers a lot of engineering. The objectives we're looking at can be framed as quadratic functions of the field. So that means we have one term, we can have a constant term, then we can have some term that depends linearly on the field, and then we can have some term that depends on um, the square of the field, basically. So if you look back, the equations I wrote that are now equivalent to Maxwell's equations but are applicable for any um, design geometry, these are also quadratic equations. So playing with this knob, I can write down an approximation of whatever or a vast number of uh, design problems that are of interest to people as a quadratically constrained quadratic program. So that means one of these quadratic objective functions subject to a list of quadratic constraints. And when you write down this program, there's an associated Lagrangian. So this is very much related to, or very close to Lagrangians that you see in physics. Um, we have some kind of objective. This is the, the Q naught T. This is a quadratic function, plus some um, additional part of the Lagrangian that has to do with all the constraints that we want to impose. And to each one of these constraints, these QK, is associated a multiplier, um, mu K. And again, these, these are doing exactly what you're, you're familiar with in physics. The multipliers are constraining you to the manifold um, where these constraints are actually true. And to properly solve the problem, what you need to do is you need to work out 
what are all the multiplier values and what are all the t values such that all of the partial derivatives of Lagrangian are satisfied. So you want these uh, KKT conditions. What duality uh, does is it's just, it says, well, let's be kind of lazy. Um, I know that I should work out all the correct multiplier values in order to find a true minimum or maximum. But let's just suppose that I, I don't do that. So <laughs> kind of like a purposeful misunderstanding of the problem. Let's say I just take the supremum of L, supposing that mu is a set of known coefficients. So supposing that I know all the multiplier values, can I find the best T? Um, in the case of quadratic functions, just like in calculus, you know, quadratics, quadrat a quadratic um, equation is easy to solve. The minimum and maximum of these quadratically constrained quadratic programs when the multipliers are fixed are also easy to solve. So it's easy to work out what the best T should be if I just assumed all the different values of these multipliers were given. So if I do this, I can work out a function that now depends on the value of the multipliers that I give it. And this thing has some really cool properties. Uh, mainly, it's always a bound on the primal problem, meaning that its value is always bigger than or smaller than the best value you could get out of your about out of properly treating your optimization problem so the way to understand this is like um you can always explore the when we're when we're saying we're taking the supremum over t over all these different currents you're allowing the optimization program to effectively look at all the physical t vectors where the constraints are actually satisfied and if the constraints are actually satisfied, then each one of these constraint functions, these QK that I included, they're actually zero, right? The constraint is satisfied when the constraint function is zero. So the values I pick from UK there are immaterial. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what value I pick for, for mu if I'm at a T that satisfies all the constraints. So these are always possible values for the program to explore for any for any um, set of mu values. And so if it happens to find a T that's unphysical when, it, when you're doing this uh, supremum optimization, it means that it's necessarily better than any physical one. And the new game is to try to change, is to try to play with these multipliers to minimize the objective as much as possible. So you're trying to, to make, to force this um, easy misunderstanding of the problem to be as close to the true solution, the true multiplier solution of the problem as possible. The other really big important thing about this um, function, the dual, is that it's convex, which means it's really, really easy to optimize. So you can solve this second game of trying to find the minimum or the best values of mu to make this dual as small as possible. That's a very easy optimization problem. So, Rather than having this complicated landscape where there's many, many different hills and valleys, we know that if we do this transformation, this duality transformation, we end up with a function that only has one hill or valley. And we can just follow the gradients to the peak or uh, the bottom. So kind of visually what we're doing is we have this different set of, um, here we're looking at a one, uh, we're looking at a quadratically constrained program subject to one constraint. And so the true manifold of the constraint is this blue arrow. And what we're doing in the dual is we're kind of considering this larger set of sheets. And this is why the optimization becomes so much easier. Uh, and the value of these sheets is set by the value of our multiplier, set by the value of our single multiplier. And for any given value of mu, what we're doing is we're finding the maximum of the, we're finding the largest value in terms of L, in terms of this vertical direction on the sheet. The goal of the dual program in the case of strong duality where you actually solve your initial problem is to kind of bend these sheets in a way through the value of the mu, uh, through the value of the multiplier, so that the maximum corresponds to a point on the actual manifold of the constraint. So we want the maximum to actually happen on this kind of one dimensional arrow. And so if our value of mu is too small, it could be that the maximum happens, you know, kind of like in this, um, with 
kind of within the boundary sort of thing of, of how I've drawn it here. And then as we increase the value of mu, the sheet bends until eventually the maximum happens on the actual um, constraint itself. Okay, so this technique is not guaranteed to, to solve the problem. It's, in a, it's a relaxation. Um, going to duality, we've changed our original NP hard problem class into something that's convex. So we've made our problem much easier. But the really interesting thing is that in photonics, uh, for these geometry design problems, and I have some early indications that in other physical contexts as well, these duality relaxations work very, very well. So basically like the, the difference between the duality solution, which is a bound on your problem, and the true maximum turns out to be very small. And in most cases, we actually find that it matches completely. So going to this convex problem, we and playing with the multipliers instead of trying to solve the fields, we are actually able to solve the initial optimization problem. So this is uh, really interesting because it amalgamates many previous techniques for bounds. So we're dealing with the true physics of Maxwell's equations, and we don't have to do this in kind of like a chaining way. Because we've framed everything in terms of optimization, all the constraints are considered as one uh, at once. So it's not like I take my objective and I say, you know, this quantity can only be so big, so that gives me an inequality. And then once I've done that, then I know that this quantity can be so big. And then another inequality where these things aren't talking to each other, so there's no interplay. Here, there is correct interplay between all the different constraints. So the fact that you must have scattering into place with the fact that you must have absorption and these two things together um, give you interesting results. Uh, it's also very interesting in that in the end, it can be viewed as a single constraint. So no matter how many constraints you end up applying, it ends up being that within this um, duality transformation, it's equivalent to solving an optimization problem with one single constraint. So this is really, to me, interesting from a physical level because it means for many of these optimization problems, so a lot of problems related to electromagnetic wave phenomena, there is actually just one quadratic function that tells you why um, an objective can only be achieved to some certain level. And this turns out to be extremely accurate. Um, so that I think is something I don't fully understand yet, but uh, to me, very interesting. And if you're in theory, hopefully interesting to you as well. Um, the other interesting things is that these can be used uh, as termination conditions, and then they let us answer a lot of the problems we had with Inder's design uh, at the start. So I said I've kind of introduced two different relaxations. The first was the number of constraints I'm going to employ. And then once I've cut down the number of constraints, then I can use this duality transformation to get a bound on my problem. Well, I can use this as a surrogate for, for what I can do within a given geometry and with um, a given set of material properties. So now I can kind of have a good idea before I start the problem of, you know, how big does my box have to be? If I'm limited to this kind of material, what, what change does that make? If I need these fabrication constraints, what kind of change does that make? I can have a good idea that I can calculate much more rapidly um, about how the inverse design is going to perform or how it should perform at least to the limits of my bounds. Uh, something that has just we're just getting started with right now is in integrating these with standard inverse design methods. So in doing these duality calculations, we find a field that's not always physical, but it's definitely optimal. And so this is kind of like a global characterization of your design problem that I said was very hard to characterize globally. And so I think there's a very there's a lot of potential here for using these fields that you calculate through inverse design as a way to inform your other kind of forward inverse design methods. So this is uh, very exciting, but I won't talk about it too much today, unfortunately. So that's really the big picture of what I'm doing that could apply to your own work. The rest of the talk, and I'm just going to go for another uh, eight minutes or so, is going to be showing you some examples of why, why we're talking about this in the first place, showing you that it does actually work. So these require you to be somewhat familiar with photonics. So uh, if you're not familiar with photonics, maybe you can just think about uh, how, how this stuff applies to your own work. Otherwise, I think I have something interesting to tell you. So um, here we're looking at bounds on scattering cross sections. So this is getting back to this picture I showed of you have some kind of 
confining volume. And then within the volume, you have some material or you have known uh, with known properties and you're allowed to structure that thing however you want. And the goal here is I have an incoming plane wave and I'm trying to make the scattering cross section. So kind of like the effective geometry of this thing as large as possible compared to its geometric um, area. So kind of like the, the actual physical uh, volume of space occupied. The lines are correspond to different colors of lines correspond to different values of material loss. So this is kind of showing how loss enters the problem. And they're done with metals and dielectrics for, for two different real values of the electric susceptibility. <clears throat> and then there's solid lines and dashed lines. So the dashed lines are done imposing only one single constraint on this problem. And that's the constraint that the optical theorem or kind of like the conservation of real power must be satisfied. So this is saying that whatever power is, is being, is interacting with this domain from, from the plane wave, well, that has to be accounted for in re-radiation and absorption. The solid lines um, include an additional constraint on the reactive power. So this is, this is saying the same thing, but kind of in phase, the, the, the phase corollary, I guess, of the real power um, constraint. So kind of like in my circuit, you know, I can only have resonance in, in a circuit if I match inductance and capacitance in a certain way. In optics, it's not always possible to set up uh, a resonance. And this gives you additional constraints on what can be accomplished in a, in a given volume of space. The little dots that you see that are colored as one of the lines correspond to the performance actually discovered by topology optimization. So you can see that even with two constraints for uh, this radius of the spherical boundary, this is um, describing the volume of, that we're allowed to do the optimization over. So for, for volumes spanning from very, very small you know, going down to 10 to the minus three um, compared to the wavelength. So very, very deeply sub wavelength up to wavelength scale. So going up to kind of like 10 wavelengths big for this scattering ball. We see that the line predicted by doing these bounds corresponds very, very nicely with what you can actually get out of topology optimization. So for these, um, particularly for metals, you can almost completely describe why there's a, a scattering cross-section limit for what you can achieve just from this conservation of, of real power. That's enough to, to tell you why you can't do any better than this um, scattering cross-section. And it also reproduces all the geometric optics. So you, as the wavelength gets really big, you can see we're tending towards this 4 pi value. So this is, is kind of like a, a known classical limit. This is very interesting. So. It's kind of like enough to get to geometric optics just to think about real power. And then if you, if you want more precision, you have to add more constraints. Um, in adding this um, phase, you'll notice that there's a little bit of gap between the solid and dashed lines. This corresponds to the dilution factor necessary um, on average to get to the plasmon polariton resonance condition. So it's kind of like if I start with a very strong metal, I have to dilute it a little bit uh, in order for to get to chi to the minus three, I would have to kind of effectively introduce some, some free volume or volume not occupied by metal in order to introduce, in order to get it to become resonant, in order to get a resonant interaction with the plane wave. And um, this, this is what it's accounted for in this dilution factor. In the case of the dielectric, this inclusion of reactive power does something much more powerful. So you can see that there's many, many orders of magnitude for a very small, uh, radius confining volumes between what is possible when you only impose the conservation of real power versus imposing the conservation of real and reactive power. And the solid line corresponds exactly to Rayleigh scattering. So <laughs> for a dielectric imposing conservation of real and reactive power, that tells you that uh, actually the limit, the best scattering you could ever achieve actually corresponds to the Rayleigh limit of small scattering for a dielectric particle. And as the volume gets larger, suddenly we have the possibility of getting kind of like a cavity confinement, engineering a mode inside of our dielectric. And the scattering cross section compared to the geometric cross section shoots up. And this is again very nicely captured by the bounds. 
Although you can see there's more of a mismatch here between what is found by inverse design and, and what the bounds discover. So capturing a lot of true physics with, with only two constraints and telling you what can be expected from your inverse design to roughly a factor of 10 or so with just two constraints. Uh, you can use this for, we can, we can kind of push this idea and, and talk about like from the bounds, which materials are best, what is the regime of resonant response? What is the regime of Rayleigh response? All this information is there in the bounds and can be used to kind of say, well, I'm going to need this kind of material if I want to achieve this kind of performance. If I have access to a larger volume, maybe I can reduce um, what kind of materials are needed because now I can do more geometric structuring. All this information is there. Um, we can also show similar things with periodic systems and gratings. So here's an example looking at absorption. And I'll just uh, kind of breeze through the rest of these and give a little bit of time for questions. And if one uh, catches your eye and you want to talk about it later, feel free to ask me about it. So here we're doing um, absorption and periodic gratings, again, showing bounds and inverse design and a fairly good agreement between the two. Here we're doing uh, kind of more, I guess, less classical examples. Here we're, we're doing a bounds on a meta lens. And we're including an additional feature here of the fact that a metal lens should work to focus many different angles of incoming plane waves at the same location. And kind of like as the number of these channels or as the number of incident angles grows, if I'm fixed to a given volume, how much performance can I get? And it's clear that the, the performance does diminish. So kind of like the limits of engineering for these kind of devices, it re requires a certain volume of space. If you if you have a small volume of space, there's only so much you can do for um, a given material. Then finally, kind of a more fictitious example, but um, maybe not so far fetched of doing kind of optical mathematics. So here we're trying to implement a geometry that would work through scattering to implement either a Volterra kernel or a differentiation kernel. So the idea would be you have some kind of incoming field you look at the field on a line prior to the scattering object. And what you would like to see on the other side of the scattering object is the integral of that field along the line or its derivative. And again, uh, we're showing how the performance changes between inverse design and bounds as we try to include more fields. So kind of here, here we're looking at the fields generated from a dipole. And as we include more dipoles, as we make this field that we have to integrate or take the derivative of more complicated, how does the performance of even a hypothetical um, bound degrade as, as we add these additional channels? One last slide about the ongoing work. Again, getting back to this idea, I think the most interesting um, direction for this stuff to go is incorporating bounds with existing inverse design methods. And if you're interested in that, please check out this uh, article um, published with the I published with the Rodriguez group, kind of reviewing our work and uh, hopefully looking forward to to where this is going. I'm yeah, I'm gonna skip this part for now. And uh, yeah, I'll just leave this up for a second here that here's a few references if you're if you're interested. And finally, uh, we're not the only group, uh, I'm not the only person who's worked on this. So particularly I should mention uh, the groups of Matt Gustafson, um, Yelena Vukovic and Owen Miller have also made very big contributions to this area. Um, we're all kind of circling around the same ideas. I take this as uh, indication that we're all headed in the right direction and there's really something very interesting here. Uh, with that, I'm going to close. Thank you very much for listening and thanks to everyone else who is involved in making this work possible. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, I mean, you were in time, so we have time for a few questions. So if uh, there's anyone in the audience who wants to make a question, just unmute yourselves and uh, and throw the question to, to Sean. Let me see if... Well, while I think you can unmute yourselves, don't you? Anyway, in the meantime, I'm, I'm going to throw a few questions to Son. Okay. So, Son, uh, 
I mean, in, I'm I'm really puzzled by this uh, midfield relaxation. So uh, okay. this this relaxation of uh, Maxwell equations uh, locally. Uh, I mean, you you talked about microscopic and macroscopic. What does that mean? Uh, what is micro? What is macro? What is the length scale that is uh -huh. relevant? Yeah. I mean, Okay, so here when I'm saying micro and macro, I'm thinking of kind of whatever is the smallest relevant frequency in your problem. So uh, a lot of for a lot of problems, we can get away with one frequency, but maybe even if we have a bandwidth, then it becomes the, the smallest frequency. And from the smallest frequency, even the kind of highest quality materials that we have, you can only really get your wavelength to, to change maybe in a hyperbolic media, we can do better uh, at some point, but it's like a factor of a thousand. Um, beyond a factor of a thousand or so, it's, it's very difficult to imagine a situation where your field would change more rapidly than that. So kind of like you might compress a wavelength down to a factor of a thousand, uh, but further than that, it doesn't really seem that realistic. So basically you, so, have, to re you have to resolve the smallest feature. As, as right. so you, but you don't always have to resolve the smallest feature of your geometry. And this gets into kind of like the metamaterial picture, right? So like if, if the scattering object <clears throat> only generates, what is only able to compress the, the effective wavelength down to, let's say for, for the sake of argument to a factor of 10, well then the features that are at a factor of a hundred smaller than the wavelength, these are only ever seen by the wave as effective medium um, in an effective medium sort of way. So kind of like only the only thing that actually matters to the wave is the effective property. And the true scattering properties are only seen if I can compress the wave down to, you know, the point where the its wavelength is roughly on the scale of the geometric structuring that I'm going to do. So if I structure much below that limit, eventually the the kind of net effect is is very much a metamaterial effect and so this is um exactly what we do in like fdtd or any one of these other simulations is that you know if i make my resolution fine enough then i can say that i have a true physical field because if i continue increasing the resolution nothing about my field changes and yeah. kind of the, the intuition behind this is that now the, the field is only seeing this, this metamaterial change in, in your geometry. So kind of like, let's, let's imagine a corner or something. The fact that this corner is a square instead of an actual perfect line doesn't matter because within the volume of the object, what matters is that the, the kind of density or the amount of material that's there does match up so that the, the metamaterial characteristics of these two things they eventually lead, lead to the same point. Um, the macroscopic or microscopic then is, I can take this a step further and say, well, even if it's slightly wrong on, on the micro scale, and, and so this comes from my, from, or this idea is sort of very much related to what I saw early in the metamaterial days, is that even if the field is wrong inside the object, its characteristics far away from the object tend to be quite accurate. And why this happens is that your dipole moments tend to be the, the most important thing the further away you get. So kind of like the further away you move from an object, you can also do better and better approximations with less and less information. So eventually kind of like if you're infinitely far away from an object, it's a dipole. The closer you get to an object, the more kind of different multiple moments you have to take into account. And so getting the equations right on average is good enough for certain characteristics and not for others. And so this is kind of where we have to play with this dial of adding in additional constraints or maybe just global constraints are good enough. I'm not, I hope, maybe uh, some aspect of this wasn't really answered so well. No, 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 I understand. But now that you mentioned metamaterials, uh, uh -huh. uh, what happens when uh, your effective Maxwell equations are not local? No, you know, all these non-local description of metamaterials after the homogenization and so on. I assume yeah. all this all this assumes local electromagnetics, no? But if you have a, a theory that is non-local, then all this should be taken with care, no? Because now uh, some of the assumptions are not valid anymore, no? Well, 
everything to do with non-locality can still be captured, although it definitely gets more complicated. Um, so, I, so what I show today is definitely limited to the case of a local material constant. So not, no, no, no. not a local metamaterial, but you're saying that your material has, has, uh, can be described locally. And so usually that's a very good approximation. I mean, I think the only case where this is not valid generally is in metals, um, metals and very, very strong fields interaction between plasmons. Um, otherwise, yeah. pretty good. It's a pretty good approximation. And even there, there is something we can do, but I haven't shown how, how okay. to do that. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. I have more, qu and another question, but uh, any other people in the audience? Hello, Enrico. Hello, Sean. Nice Hi. to meet you. Um, I would like to ask um, if you can comment a bit more about this equivalent, like you, you write equivalent to Maxwell. So, um, and then you write some adjoint operators. Like, um, so what is the Hilbert space you're thinking about? What, why can you use all this kind of machinery? Okay, so um, maybe one at a time, I guess. Why is it equivalent to Maxwell? Well, uh, it's equivalent to Maxwell if you take the full space of projection operators. So in going from this, in this blue box, the first line I wrote down is, is an operator equation. Mm -hmm. And that operator equation is, is what I'm claiming is um, equivalent to, to Maxwell's equation. And a way to see this is to bring in the adjoint operator and the fields and look at what this collection of constraints says for the space of all P operators. So, okay, for a given P operator, so for a given projection into some region of space, one constraint is obviously not equivalent to Maxwell's equations, right? So if, if you kind of believe Maxwell's equations are equivalent to FBTD, then you know that you have this, you have this operator equation, right? And you have a very, very large list of constraints. So you have like a vector of constraints. So the idea that you could capture this entire, you know, vector of constraints with one constraint that stretches credulity. Uh, and we, I agree with you there. Where it becomes equivalent is that if you look at the list of constraints that you can generate with this form, so by, by looking at this, um, P for all different possible projections. So projecting into each point of space individually and then projecting along different directions. The, the constraints that you set on T end up being exactly equivalent to these constraints that you set on the total current. And so why it ends up being equivalent is ultimately, I know I'm going in circles a little bit, but why it ends up being equivalent is the fact that scattering theory works. So why it ends up being equivalent is the fact that this first operator equation that, that I wrote down exists, that there is a linear operator that maps between initial currents and total currents. And once you have this operator that, that maps between initial and total currents, then I would need a set of, um, I need a set of constraints that says what this operator is. And if I know the inverse of this operator, which is given by this V minus one minus GB restricted to the volume of the scattering operator, then that is an equivalent formalism. So the fact that it's the inverse of this thing completely determines what the operator is. And the entire physics is really buried in the, in the Green's function. So it's kind of like the equivalence here is coming from the fact that the inverse of this operator that I wrote down is really the Maxwell equation. So it's kind of like inverted, right? So the Green's function with in the background, that's kind of like your Maxwell operator in free space, but inverted. And then I have the scattering medium, but inverted. So this is really very similar to, to the Maxwell operator. And then we're saying that T is kind of like the inverse of this thing. And so this is where all the physics are being captured. And then the next thing we can do is we can say, I can build up these, these quadratic constraints and these quadratic constraints, if I were to, if I were to take the, the limit of every possible projection that I wanted, every possible projection that exists, that would be totally equivalent to the differential equations. But because there's this limit on wavelength, ultimately I don't need to do that. I can look at a, a subset of constraints 
And if I'm smart, it might be a very small subset that captures kind of like the important physics of the problem. Um, for the question about the Hilbert space, this is actually pretty easy. We're normally looking, uh, I like to do things in compact domains. So uh, I, I don't really like these, these infinite examples, but in the case of a, a compact domain, then everything is really nice. So it's kind of like we, we're usually limited to engineering our, our physical object or doing, doing our design within some kind of finite volume of space. And then we can think of the Hilbert space is just like the fields that can live inside this compact volume. And, and then so everything works out really, really nicely, even in the infinite dimensional case. Um, yeah, that, that part turns out to be pretty easy. As long as you're not in the, as long as you're not in the infinite extent case, that there's some more challenges there. And for the infinite extent case, we usually have to do kind of like um, periodic boundary conditions or something to, to make sure that we're rigorous about the map. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So we are already five times over the the time, five minutes over the time. So I think we can finish here. Thank you very much, Son. Oh, thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time and your very nice talk. Yeah. And uh, thank you all for attending and see you in our next uh, seminar. Bye, guys. Yeah, stay, Son.